right to her here at Sharp Facets Gallery. It is lunchtime. It is Meet Me at the Diner. And today I have Susan Campbell Bartoletti. Is that correct? That's correct, Anne. And uh, of course you wrote The Boy Who Dared. And that's been Greenwood Reed right here. And uh, you've been uh, touring the schools, I understand, after you gave a nice talk at the library Sunday afternoon. I have. I have visited um, several schools over the course of the two days, and I've just had a great time. Yeah, well, that's great. What do you, what do you think of Greenwood, and what do you think of the fact that they chose the boy that dared? It's a very humbling experience to find out that a community has chosen your book, your book to read and to discuss and to share. And I just have enjoyed every minute of meeting the people who came out to the library on Sunday and to... Um, meeting the readers and to hear what they had to say and to answer some of their questions. Yeah, that's, uh, that's going to be terrific. Of course, Prudence here, uh, this has been unique to have a live author here, hasn't it? <laughs> it's been a wonderful experience. It really, really has. Um, the last two books we did, uh, To Kill a Mockingbird was the first one, and of course Harper Lee is still alive. But she's elderly and she's unable and unwilling to travel, which is fine. And then no, 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 no. It was not fine as far as you were concerned. Your greatest desire would have been for her to have been able to be here because you know that you think that's the finest book ever written, right? That's true. <laughs> <laughs> the great American novel has been written and it is called To Kill a Mockingbird, <laughs> in my humble opinion. Yes, right. Or not so humble opinion. Uh, and then we did The Call of the Wild, and of course, Jack London uh, has been long, long gone. Right. So this year, with our third uh, Greenwood Reads project, when we did chose The Boy Who Dared, I was so thrilled that uh, the writer was living, and also that... I was uh, also thrilled to find out I was living. <laughs> <laughs> yes. and, uh, and that she was willing to come. Sure. Mm -hmm. So, um, Susan, now, where do you live now? I live in northeastern Pennsylvania. I live in a small town just outside of Scranton, Pennsylvania. And for those listeners who want to know, yes, I do buy all my paper at Dunder Mifflin. <laughs> okay. And, uh, and, and, and how was the weather up there, Susan? How was it when you left? Well, we had a very mild winter this year, and I made a big to-do over wanting to drive down so I wouldn't have to worry about snow and airports and airplanes. And so our second snow of the winter came on the day that I was leaving. <laughs> <laughs> ah, interesting, interesting. So, um, Susan, now when you were growing up, um, you 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 had a brother, and then you 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 were telling me your dad died. You never really knew your dad. Um, yes, um, I was. Um, when I was a baby, my dad died suddenly in a car accident when I was two months old. My mother was 23, and so she was left with my older brother, who was 20 months at the time, uh, a newborn, me. And um, so, you know, that's, that was our family for um, several years. Then my mom remarried when I was about six, and uh, she, we went on to get three more siblings, um, two brothers and a sister. That's great. That's great. So um, what did your stepdad do? My stepdad worked in printing. He was a printer, uh, which was... That's interesting since she's into writing books now, isn't it? Yes. Very interesting because one of the talents I never realized he had um, was with printing. His um, ability to discern color was amazing. And um, I didn't realize that until I was actually painting um, the house that we live in. And when I found the wrong color green, he knew exactly why it was the wrong color green, that it had too much of a particular pigment in it. And so, um, you know, that was just amazing to me, to find the skill, late in life, and talent that he had. Well, it had to be interesting because um, what type of things you, you wanted to be an artist at some point, didn't you? I did. Uh, growing up, there were two things I liked to do best. Um, of course, I loved to read, and I loved to draw. And if anyone were to ask me what I wanted to be when I grew up, I would have told them an artist. I wanted to, to draw. I wanted, to, at one time, it was, you know, I wanted to have my own comic strip. Uh, later, as I was in high school, <laughs> I moved from comic strip to becoming um, some sort of commercial artist. You think if you were a, um, this just hit me now, if you were a, a comic strip, the type of books that you wrote, what type of comic strip do you think you would have had, Susan? <laughs> 
Uh, you know, if you look at my total body of work, most of my books are very serious. They're about tragic, dark, depressing yes. times in history. And I actually um, enjoy comedy very much. Um, what you won't find on my website is that I did improv comedy for two years. Um, I performed, How about that? I performed in Scranton for two years. And it was a really nice outlet, you know. By day, I'm working with um, buried in research about the Third Reich. And at night, I got to um, go to class and go to the shows and participate and, and just laugh. And so I think if... What kind of sense of humor do you have here, Susan? <laughs> <laughs> that would be my question. Well, you would have to have come to a show to find yeah. out. Yeah. <laughs> do you have a dark sense of humor? Um, I can. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I can have, a, you know, my, my humor can go. You know, I, I, I guess I was um, with the, um, the um, comedy teacher. Who, who was, you know, responsible for our troupe. I was on the cerebral team. The cerebral team. <laughs> okay, interesting. So I guess you would call my humor cerebral. Cerebral, okay. <laughs> All right, so uh, well, there you go. Well, that's very interesting, the contrast, isn't it? Yeah, it so, is. So do you still do any comedy or not anymore? Uh, no, I, um, I did an exit stage left uh, several years ago. Would you like to go back to it? Oh, I would love to go back to it. Um, you know, we always have those dreams, um, and one of my dreams is to do some, seri some serious comedy writing. <laughs> serious comedy <laughs> writing? You know, for yourself or for somebody else? Well, you always write for yourself. Right. Um, you know, that's the person, that's the audience you are probably pleasing first. But, um, no, I would want to, I would want to work for you know, John Stewart, Stephen Colbert, Saturday Night Live. <laughs> <laughs> See, now, did you, you know, the things we learn in this interview, I mean, in these interviews, aren't they fabulous? They really are. <laughs> they really are. You're a great interviewer, Anne. I would never have thought to ask her that. I would See? never have gotten that information. See, there you go. We're just having fun talking with Susan Campbell Bartoletti. She, of course, wrote The Boy Who Dared. Yes, we just have found out she would have liked to have been a comic strip. And from that count, little comment, we talked about what you uh, that you did improv uh, comedy improv. So here we are today. We're talking about this now, though. Um, some of the things that uh, you were telling me, though, before we got on the air, was a very interesting story about winning fifteen dollars. That is a very interesting story, and it goes to the fact of what your motto is, or what your theme is, I think. Well, my motto is to move through your fear, and that's actually a motto that um, comedians use, onstage comedians use, because you can be terrified, and you can be on stage, and you have to move through your fear. And I think that's a wonderful approach to life, that we figure out what it is we are afraid of, and then move through it. We can't freeze, we can't fight, we have to move. Uh, so, yes, um, I won't avoid the question about the 15 hours. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good, it's a good it's story. A really, it's a good story, Absolutely. and it's one that I, I have never told publicly. Uh, when I was in high school, uh, I loved art class. In fact, um, as a junior in high school, I filled up my schedule and I did not take typing that year because uh, it meant that I could not have taken art and it went, meant that I could not have taken my French class. And I wanted both French and I wanted art. So I didn't take typing and I figured, oh, what the heck, why, why am I ever going to need typing? So, <laughs> <laughs> interesting answer here today, yes. And so uh, that year I also entered an art contest. It was a local art contest and my uh, piece of art won and I won $15. So I immediately went to the mall, it was a brand new mall, and I bought blue suede platform shoes. And I loved those platform shoes. Now keep in mind that I lived out in the country, and in order to catch the school bus in the morning, I had to walk three quarters of a mile down a dirt road so that I wouldn't have to catch the bus too early. 
So I got up, walked three quarters of a mile down that dirt road in my nice suede blue platform shoes, rode the bus to school. At the end of the school day, I would get off the bus at the top of the hill so that I could hang out longer with my friends and I wouldn't have quite as long of a walk. And so that day when I got off the bus, I made a terrifying discovery that the township had oiled the dirt roads while I had been in school. This was something they did often, um, once the, I should say often, each year they did it in order to keep the dust down. And now I was staring at big puddles of black oil all over the road. There is no way to avoid it. And I'm, I was wearing my brand new blue suede platform shoes. Oh, you could just weep at that story. So what did I do? I'm ready to cry. I know. It's <laughs> terrible. So I, what could I do? I took my shoes off and I walked barefoot all the way home carrying my shoes. Now I had black oily feet and I had to somehow get into the house to the bathroom without leaving black footprints all over the floor. So I crawled on my hands and knees with my feet up in the air, made my way to the bathroom, made my way to, into that sink, put my feet into the sink and I scrubbed at those feet until they were clean but naturally <gasps> the sink, the floor, the walls were not very clean. <laughs> And then I had to move through the fear of facing my mother. <laughs> <laughs> An excellent story. Bravo. <laughs> we are going to hear a word from our sponsors. When we come back, we're going to be talking more with Susan Campbell Bartoletti. She is the writer of The Boy Who Dared, which is, of course, Greenwood Reads for this year. Hey, we're going to hear a word from our sponsors. We'll be back. If you've got a question for Susan, don't hesitate to give us a call, 229-7984. That's 229 Oh, that's right. We're back here at Sharp Facets Gallery on the 72 Bypass. We're having a good conversation here today with Susan Campbell Bartoletti. And, of course, she wrote the book, The Boy Who Dared. You know, Susan, I, I've looked over the books that you've written. Growing Up in Coal Country, that one's not a very uplifting, I guess we could say. It's kind of another... Yeah, they're kind of depressing books, aren't they? They're, well, they're down books. They're not uh, happy I'll, light books. I'll argue that point because Growing Up in Cool Country is a story about the boys between the ages of 7 and 16 who worked in the coal mines in the anthracite fields in Pennsylvania. And yes, I mean, think about child labor. It's a very sad subject. Yet at the We same may need to go back to it today. <laughs> Maybe you're on to something. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> it, you know, it's a, it's, I mean, when you look at a, a nation that has chosen to use its children in order to achieve what it considers a greater good, yes, that's a tough subject. But at the same time, we can look at these child laborers and um, look at the power and the agency that they had, uh, what wages gave them. And uh, so my book is different. There are um, many books out there on the subject of child labor. But because I am taking a look at the power and the agency also of working children, uh, what I know about eighth grade children and children in general uh, is that uh, they have a very strong sense of justice. They know right from wrong. And they don't like it when life isn't fair. And when life isn't fair, they want someone to fix it. Sometimes that someone is them. Sometimes it's uh, someone else. And so, do you think we're born with the with the right and wrong? We know right and wrong when we're born, because you know it would seem to me that as society changes, how do we know what's mm -hmm. right and wrong? Yes, uh, that's a very. When do we acquire um, a knowledge of what is right and what is wrong? I mean, I think I, I don't know that we are. You're asking if we are born with a conscience. No. And, you know, that is something probably that is acquired. I mean, many um, relig religious people have debated at what age, and, you know, some say it's the age of seven. Uh, I think that, um, you know, we learn in many different ways, and w children learn from what they are shown. No one is, no one is um, born with um, hatred, and yet why do people hate? It's something that, that's something that is acquired. Mm -hmm. uh, but when we look at, you know, Children. When we look at the children who um, who do know right and wrong, um, in the field of child labor, we also know that they went out on strike for the things that they wanted. They wanted their right to go to school. They wanted um, 
better wages. They wanted better working conditions. And by working conditions, we mean safer working conditions. So you can find wherever children have worked throughout the, um, the industrial history of the United States, you will find also that children have banded together and lobbied for these things. Does it compare to uh, like the way England and uh, Ireland and, and some of those countries, or was this is this just what you're saying from in well, America? In the 19th century, which is really our industrial period, we sort of followed what was happening in England, and England had. Um, child labor laws before we did. England had um, unions before we did. And as we were getting uh, workers from England, from Wales and from England, these are the people that were organizing and unionizing here in the States. Also the Germans as they were coming in, the Italians as they were coming in, you can just see the waves of immigrants. But as you follow out our industrial history, mm -hmm. so things tended to start abroad, right, and work their way here. Yeah. So, uh, all right. So, you said you connect very well with eighth graders. Now, you taught eighth graders. I did. I never intended to teach. I was offered a teaching position within days of graduation from college, and I thought, well, why not? <laughs> <laughs> I have to admit, it um, took me a good year <laughs> to get used to them. <laughs> and uh, you know, the, I tell people that by the time you get a room full of eighth graders quiet, now remember, you not only must get them quiet, but you also must teach them something. Yes. That was quite a, uh, a, a trick to do both. Uh, you could just feel the room vibrating with their energy. And um, you know, before long I discovered that it was very easy to get hooked on middle school kids, mm -hmm. and I was hooked. And so I stayed, I never intended to stay teaching, but I ended up staying for 18 years. Now all the while that I was teaching, I was also doing all the homework assignments. If my students wrote a poem, I wrote a poem. If they wrote a story, I wrote a story. I did all the grammar assignments, all the literature assignments, and I even took their tests. <laughs> because? <laughs> well, I took their tests because what if there was a bad question on the test? If I got it wrong, I had to look at that question again and see, you know, right, is this worded in the best way? Right. So um, it was it was great. Yeah, I, I liked doing that. Um, sometimes I would sit in on their classes, especially when computers came into the middle school. Mm -hmm. I ended up taking, um, I had um, a planning period at the same time that my students were taking a, their first computer class. And so I would um, do my planning either in the early hours or, or late hours at night and I would use my planning period to sit in on their computer class because I wanted to learn what they were learning. So, um, Did you ever feel you were forever stuck in eighth grade? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Here's what I learned. I learned that three minutes between classes is not possibly enough time to move from one end of a crowded hall to the other end of the crowded hall and use the restroom. I believe that now, honey. Yes, yes, students had it tough. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what happened was, is my students would bring their the things that they were writing into class. Uh, we would um, look at it and go through the writing process together and try to figure out, well, how can we make this story better? How can they, what are our suggestions? And then every once in a while, I would bring something I wrote into class, and my students would offer me suggestions. So there, my eighth graders became my very first writing group. And um, I, the first big discovery that any writer makes is, of course, discovering her writing voice mm -hmm. and discovering her audience. And so I credit my eighth grade students with that. And today, now I left the classroom in 1997, and I'm hearing from students today, former students who are now writing, and they write to me, and they thank me, and they tell me that this is what they want to do. And I How does that make you feel? I love it. I love it. And every once in a while, when I hear from my former students, I will um, let them know that we're going to have like a little open house in my house. So it's like a little reunion. Right. And they come and, you know, we um, talk about writing and, and publishing and I just hope they do something. That has to be a great sense of accomplishment mm -hmm. to be able to know that you influenced other people to be able to go on to do something. It, it is a very good 
feeling because, you know, often we don't tell the people who have influenced us. That's true. And so often, you know, they're unsung heroes, and, um, and my eighth graders are my heroes. Well, that's terrific. Hey, we are here at Sharp Passes Gallery on the 72 Bypass. We are talking to Susan Campbell Bartoletti, Bartoletti and we are going to hear a word from uh, South Carolina News already in progress and a word from our sponsors. We'll be back. Don't you? That's right. We're back here at Sharp Facets Gallery. We're having a big conversation over here with Susan Campbell Bartoletti, where, of course, she wrote uh, The Boy Who Dared. She's written a lot of other books, uh, actually, uh, been quite uh, prolific here. You got a new book that you're working on? I do have a new book I'm, I'm working on. I'm working on a novel right now. It's going to be part of the Dear America series. And of course, you know, I look for a tragic event in American history. And the focus of this book uh, will be the Chicago Fire of 1871. Oh, very interesting. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, because that was just annihilated and what did the where did those people go yeah well, we'll find out where one girl went <laughs> okay all right does she happen to be an eighth grader <laughs> <laughs> well since you mentioned it she does happen to be 14 years old in this story <laughs> <laughs> how'd i know <laughs> i don't know but well that's terrific that's uh that sounds great uh and a little closer to home than having to uh travel to germany oh that's true um that is true i'm for this um it's we, all, we have such a rich history here in our own country. We don't really have to look too far for good stories to tell. Yeah. Some, sometimes we only have to look as far as our dinner table. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. Of course, you have to sit down at the dinner table and have a story well, to tell. That's, yes. That is true. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, But, um, Susan, let's talk a little bit about the, the boy who dared. How you did your research, I understand that uh, you actually went to Germany and you sought out people who uh, were growing up at the time when this was going on. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Okay. Uh, before I wrote the novel, The Boy Who Dared, which is based on a true story, I wrote a nonfiction book called Hitler Youth, Growing Up in Hitler's Shadow. Now, you already know, I'm, the listeners know, I'm pretty interested in reading about dark and tragic times in history. And one of the, my areas uh, that I was reading quite a bit about was World War II. I came across one sentence that claimed that Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party rode to power on the shoulders of politically active young people. That just turned my heart right over and I thought, wow, is it true? Because naturally I don't believe everything that I read and I don't believe every email I get and I don't believe everything I hear. What I do when I hear something like that is I run to the library and I check out everything I can and that's exactly what I did. And I wanted to know, is it true? You see, Anne, I'm used to looking at children and who use their power for good, you know, fighting for things like the right to go to school and, you know, la child labor laws. And here we have eight and a half million young people who became part of Adolf Hitler's um, machinery of mass murder. So what I found out, indeed, is that um, Hitler did ha um, require eligible young people to belong to the Hitler Youth Movement, both boys and girls between the ages of 10 and 18. And in that book, Hitler Youth, um, I explore their rule in, in Nazi Germany. One of the things I do, I always begin with sec reading secondary materials and then I move into my primary resources. And I wanted to find people who had been a part of the Hitler Youth Movement. You know, these would be men and women, now they would be in their 80s and 90s. Sure. And so I began looking for them, and as I would find them, I found them in Germany, I found them in Austria, I found them in England, and of course they're, they're in many other countries as well, and they're also here in the United States. And I asked them if they would be willing to tell me their stories. Uh, now some refused, mm -hmm. some refused to talk with me, but there were many who did agree to talk with me, and they invited me into their living rooms, um, we met at restaurants, at delis, we met over the telephone, we met via email and they shared with me their stories. It had to be a fascinating time. It was, a fasc it was fascinating to hear how, um, you know, as I said earlier in the show, no one is born hating. But it was a fascinating um, dis uh, realization to me how young people were manipulated and utilized by a government. Now, it would not be fair um, to tell the story of the Hitler Youth uh, without also telling the story 
of the Jews who were children and teenagers during sure. that time when Adolf Hitler, um, those 12 years we know as the Third Reich. And so I also sought out um, Jews who were now in their 80s and 90s. And I have to say, not one refused to speak with me. I believe that. That's great. Yes. So any stories that really stood out to you? Yes, the story that I ended up using in The Boy Who Dared is the one that um, kept me up. And, you know, you research to the point where your characters, real people, and when I say characters, I'm talking about real people in history, it feels as though they're stalking you. You know, you just live with them in your head, and you'd be, you know, I'd be elbow deep in sudsy dishwater, and all of a sudden, you know, Helmuth would be talking to me, telling me his story. And here's what happened. I came across one sentence in my research that told about a 17-year-old boy named Helmuth Hübner, who was the youngest person ever on death row in Nazi Germany. He was a political prisoner. And I thought, my goodness, what could a boy have done? Mm -hmm. And I began to research that, and I found out that um, you know, it was illegal during the war. It was illegal for Germans to speak out. They had lost their freedom of speech, and they were not allowed to criticize Adolf Hitler, the Nazi Party, or the war. If they did, they were defeatists, and defeatists were traitors, and traitors went to jail. Mm -hmm. And he dared to speak out, and he and his two friends dared to distribute essays that Helmut Hübner had written. And when they were caught by the Gestapo, Helmut was sentenced to death. And that was just a story. I think of his courage. I mean, and this is the story of young people because, you know, young people don't always think in terms of gray. Everything in them is black and white. And you think it's because they're so hardwired, I mean, at that time of their life that they have so much going on? That they are very, I mean, this is the beauty of um, them is, number one, you know, Helmut Hübner thought, ah, the Gestapo will never catch us. Right. And that's really, you know, we've seen young people making decisions based on not getting caught. That's right. And, uh, I can drink and I won't yeah. get caught. I, yes, right. Yeah. But, but right or wrong. Good yes. decision. Right or wrong. Right. And, uh, and so... They also made a promise that if the Gestapo did catch one of them, that the, that boy would take all the blame and not turn in his two friends. And we see young people making promises like that as well Yes. today. But it turned out that the three boys were arrested. And um, that was just a story. I think that um, they, they were all courageous, but Helmuth ended up doing something that saved, he made a brash decision that saved the lives of his two friends, even though it would ultimately mean sacrificing his own. How, now, how did you hear of this story? You heard this from other people telling you the story. How did you hear this story, no. and how did your research of talking to other mm -hmm. people pull this together? I came across, I was reading about resistance fighters um, who were you know, uh, fighting against the Nazis, and I came across one sentence in one book about Helmut Hübner being that youngest person. And so it was in my desire to find out more about him and what he had done that led me to the names of his two friends. I learned that one of them had already passed. He died in the early 90s, so it was too late for me to interview um, that man. But the third friend was still alive, and I found him, and I contacted him, and he agreed. So you talked to him? Uh, he became a dear friend of mine, uh, a dear friend. and. So yes. he was able to give you a lot more of the real story yes. because he was actually there. Yes, yes. And so I interviewed him. Um, I found um, one of Helmut's brothers, uh, who, whom I also interviewed. I uh, was in Germany. I did research there. I got hold of um, the Gestapo file, which is about five inches thick. In what language was that? That's in German. <laughs> Do you speak a German? <laughs> <laughs> um, not well enough to do my own translate. I mean, I could loosely translate, and I could work my way through the archives, but I worked with a professional translator um, oh, wow. just to make sure that, because, you, you know, the, for a, another lang language is full of nuances, and sure, you want to absolutely. make sure you have it right. Absolutely. Yes. yes. How did it feel to be able to bring this story to life? You know, it's an honor. It's an honor. When you think that um, someone is, in, uh, is entrusting you to tell 
this story. I'm the vehicle. Okay, it's still their story. Right. I'm the vehicle, and, and that is humbling, and it is an honor. And so when I finished Hitler Youth, and then I finished The Boy Who Dared, I sent them both to Carl, who, who was the man I was able to interview, who was Helmut's friend, and I'll never forget when he called me and said, I want you to know you got it right. I had to be able to give a great sense of finish, conclusion. Yes, it did. Um, uh, sadly, Gerhardt um, passed before he was able to read the finished book, but I did hear from his son. Wow. So, great story. Hey, we're here at Sharp Facets Gallery. I am talking to Susan Campbell Bartoletti. Stay tuned. We'll be back. Oh, that's right. We're back here at Sharp Facets Gallery. Yes, I'm Ann Eller. Yes, I am here with Susan Campbell Bartoletti. And I'm also here with Prudence. So uh, what are you thinking about what you're hearing here today? I think it's fascinating. You're a wonderful interviewer. Well, I, I wasn't looking for that, but thank you very <laughs> much. <laughs> I know you weren't, but I thought I would just go ahead and say that. Yeah. But I had the pleasure of hearing Susan speak to a group of adults on Sunday, and I had the pleasure of hearing her speak to a group of uh, eighth graders yesterday at 96 High. And um, it was just, it was fascinating. She had both groups completely engaged. You know, that has to be tough to come into a town like, like Greenwood or like any town I'm sure that you go into if you do this, and to uh, get them engaged with your book because uh, the subject material, I mean, I, I, I would think, how do kids react to this book when they first are uh, talking about it or reading it? Uh, they react in, you know, various ways. I've, you know, I had one teacher tell me that her student said, why do you make us read it's such a sad story? Because it is, it's an inspiring story, but it's still a sad story. And my response to her and her students, and that this, um, this was in an earlier conversation, not one that happened this week, is that, you know, if a book is making you feel sad, or if something is making, something important is going on, and you need to pay attention to that. And so there is something very important going on in this book. Yeah. And so that's, the, that's one, but uh, that's one reaction. But two, even if the book makes them sad, they love it. Um, they want their emotions to be worked. They want their, um, you know, belief system mm -hmm. to be worked. And so it's the book that I get the most letters from readers on. Is it? It yes. is. Wow. It is. Uh, yeah. uh, it's mm -hmm. terrific. So uh, we've been talking about The Boy Who Dared, Susan Campbell Bartoletti. You know, how long did it take you to actually write this book, from, from the idea conception to actually finishing this book? Well, I have to say that this book began when I was writing that nonfiction book, Hitler Youth, and because that's when I first stumbled across Helmut's story. And I reveal part of the story in that book, but you can't tell the whole story. I knew that Helmut deserved his own book. He deserved it. So once... Do you ever feel possessed? Oh, you are possessed. <laughs> <laughs> Not you. Me. <laughs> <laughs> You're possessed. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> no, no you are pos you're possessed because you are actually breathing a person, a character to life through research, and through your words, you are stepping into, you know, the skin of another person. So uh, I would say that once I finished Hitler Youth, um, this book, I had the basic groundwork done because I understood, you know, the Third Reich Germany. And it took me um, a good two years then to write Helmut's story. Well, wow, two years. And, and when you write a book, um, Susan, how do, you, how do you actually go about writing it? I mean, do you tear up what you've written and start over when you don't like something? Or how exactly do you write? It seems as though I have to write about 60 pages um, several times and throw them away. And do you handwrite them, or did you ever learn to type? Um, <laughs> I, never, <laughs> I never did learn to type. Um, I, you know, managed to use all... <laughs> ten fingers in one way or another at times, but I never did take typing. Okay. <laughs> uh, which is a great disappointment to me. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
But um, it, I begin um, by steeping myself in research. When the facts begin to repeat themselves, I find that that is when it is time to start writing. And of course, as I'm writing, I'm still researching as I go along. Um, I tend to write, um, I, I have this, um, now this work habit where I take a timer, mm -hmm. I set it for 45 minutes, and I write for 45 minutes. The timer goes off, I take a 15 minute break. I do not check email, I do not make a phone call, I don't do any of those things. I might take a walk, I might do some laundry, but 15 minutes later I'm back at the computer for another 45 minute session. And I do this um, several times during the day. And so that's how a book gets written, in 45 minute sessions, a little bit at a time. I've talked to some people who say they try to write a chapter. You know, mm -hmm. the assignment is a chapter, and then they yes. then they can step back from it. But mm -hmm. they don't try to write a book, the whole book. They try to do chapters. Yeah. So um, now, do you have a special place that that you believe that is your magic, or the place that brings it all together for you? Uh, you mean a physical place? A sit place where you yes. like to write. Yes. Um, I have an indoor office which I love. But I also have an outdoor writing space. It's um, about 8 by 12, 8 by 10 outside. My husband built it for me out of mostly reclaimed materials. And I call it the snuggery. That's a word that comes out of The Hobbit. Yeah. And it's just a cozy little place that uh, I like to go um, to work. And it is in fact. I guess nobody touches anything in there, do Oh, it's they? locked. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's um, and so it's set in the backyard of our house. Um, there's a nice little stone path that leads down to it, and um, in the winter I wear snowshoes <laughs> to get there. Cool. So uh, that's uh, and and I'm, I'm sure you find that those places make it easy to get in the zone, whatever you're mm -hmm. trying to yes. do. Now, what if you have a writer's block? What do you do? Well, to me, writer's block uh, means that I don't know enough. And so research is the one thing um, that it, I will do in order to get writer's block. Sometimes writer's block doesn't mean that you're empty. Sometimes it means you're too full and you don't know where to begin. And so it's by teasing out the different parts, uh, which I use my journaling pages for, um, that sort of thing that um, helps. The other thing I'll do is that timer. Um, if I really feel as though I'm stuck, you know, I set that timer and I do not allow myself to stop until that timer. And at some point you're going to break through the other side of writer's block. That's great. Well, we did have a question come in. Um, Beth Rogers, she's a budding author, and she said, are you affiliated with any school or schools, and how did you get an agent or a publisher? She says, uh, you sound great. Oh, Beth, thank you. Well, let me tell you, Beth, uh, it's great to hear from an aspiring writer, and I have to tell you that I'm an aspiring writer, too. Every time <laughs> I begin a book, I'm aspiring. And, you know, it's the one career that each time you begin, you're a beginner all over again. I am affiliated um, with uh, an MFA program. I, uh, it's a brief residency MFA program, Spalding University out of Louisville, Kentucky. And um, I teach there in the writing for children's um, component of that program. I love it. It's the program that, for me, best mirrors um, what a writer's life is like. We come together for 10 days. It's a residency. And then um, the students go home and they write, which is just what I do. And I, I evaluate um, a writing conference any event, even a school visit, I evaluate by how long, far do I go, how long do I have to go before something turns my brain electric. And that has already happened for me. I had a wonderful question today from um, a student named Chloe mm -hmm. that I've asked her teacher to please send me that question in writing. It was amazing. And so um, that's what, these, what the MFA program does for me, both as a uh, mentor, a teacher, and um, as somebody who's always continuing to learn. Now the second part of that question was um, how did I get an agent or a publisher? And that's also a very good question. My very first book came out in 1994 um, and I um, sold it in 1992. I belong to an, um, an uh, association called the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. S C B 
SCBWI. You can find that online, SCBWI.org. It's the only organization um, committed to writing for young people. And what I would do is that organization sends out a newsletter. And in that newsletter, it would tell you what editors have moved from one publishing house to another. So I got it in my head that if an editor left a publishing house, A, for publishing house B, that when she got to publishing house B, she was going to need new writers. <laughs> that was a smart move. And yeah. It was brilliant because you sort of stalk them as they're moving. <laughs> <laughs> and so I only looked for editors who were um, moving to new houses <laughs> thinking, well, somebody's got to want me. Right. And it worked out for me. Uh, that said, every publishing house has its own personality. And if you were to have looked at my books, the books that I owned at the time, you would see that I owned a lot of books by Scholastic, published by Scholastic. I owned a lot of books published by Houghton Mifflin. So that was telling me that probably my personality was matching what they liked to publish. This is WLMA right here in Greenwood. Okay, go ahead, Susan. And that's the other thing. So, you know, look at the books on your own bookshelf and see who's publishing them. And um, chances are that you might already have a personality match that you didn't even know about. So, and, but was it tough for you to find a publisher or agent? Uh, it took me uh, ten attempts to sell that uh, very first picture book. Mm -hmm. um, eight um, publishers told me no. Two said, well, if you revise. And so I had to choose, I chose the publisher whose the editorial suggestions most closely matched my vision for the story. Um, I then got an agent, I'm agented today um, by Curtis Brown, mm -hmm. agency in New York, and um, sadly it's, it is hard to get an agent. I mean, a lot of agents, uh, you have to be published first before you get an agent. But the beauty of publishing in the children's world, um, we're so friendly. And <laughs> so nice. <laughs> We're just so nice. And <laughs> well, it has to be tough, though, doesn't it, in today's world, particularly with the, the downloadable books and everything that's happening in the publishing world. It's an exciting time in publishing. It's a very exciting time because there are more ways to get published today than ever before. Um, and so, the, just let me mention why we're so nice, though. Okay. <laughs> All right, Susie. Because it's actually easier to get, I think, that we're more open, um, the publishing industry is open to people who are unagented, mm -hmm. and children's books stay in print longer than um, books for adults. Right. So, but yes, it's exciting because never before have there been so many ways to get published. Sure. So, well, listen, I tell you what, this has been a lot of fun here today. I hope you've enjoyed yourself, Susan. I have tremendously. Thank you for this opportunity. It's been great. And we'll look forward to following your career out there. Now, you are also, you have a website, and you are also on Facebook, I understand. I am. I am. My website is www.scbartoletti.com. S as in Susan, C as in Campbell, Bartoletti.com. Bartoletti.com. And on Facebook? It's just me. Just you. Just my name. All right. <laughs> hey, well, check it out. She wrote The Boy Who Dared. And Prudence, we have to thank you for choosing that book and bringing such an exciting, uh, well, month and a half, two months, I guess, going on on this. Yes, and we still have the uh, photo exhibit up at the library. We did a related photos exhibit with uh, two photography classes, mm -hmm. one at Piedmont Technical College and one, to, one at Lander University. So those are there for people to come in and see, and we'll, that exhibit will be up at least through the end of the week. All right. Now, it, it isn't just a children's book, Susan. The Boy Who Dared. Yeah. Uh, not yeah. from the letters I get from readers, because I get them from adults as well as um, young readers. Absolutely. What I was going to say is, Prudence, I, yeah, I know you uh, gave out over, what, 1,500 copies of the book. Will you have any at the library if anybody wants to read it now? <laughs> we have copies that can be checked out. out to you. Um, Great. I had to give, I wound up giving my own copy away uh, to a gentleman who had some questions about the photo exhibit and some concerns about that. And the book, after he read it, he understood what we were trying to accomplish there. 
but the adults who read it have really enjoyed it. Um, I facilitated two book discussions for adults, and the comments were it really surprised me. One lady who is very well read said that she enjoyed it because it made its point so quickly, and it covered the themes of courage mm -hmm. and tolerance so well. And then there were a couple of reluctant readers, uh, these uh, people who, they can read, they can read well, they just don't like to read. Mm -hmm. And uh, one gentleman told me that he really enjoyed the book because it was short. And I thought, well, now that's good. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> that's good. Were there any other things you liked about it? And he really liked the character of Helmut and his courage. And he said, you know, it should be a sad story, but it is because his spirit was triumphant in the end. Well, there you go. Well, Susan Campbell Bartoletti, it's been a pleasure to have you here today. Thanks so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Prudence, thank you for being here today. You know, she is always there at Greenwood County Library just uh, trying to help bring things together and make programs happen. Thanks so much, Prudence. Thank you, Anne. All right. This is WLMA right here in Greenwood, South Carolina. There'll be a podcast on the website, and there'll be a video on YouTube. Everybody have a great afternoon. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye-bye.